my name is Elmer Tu, and I'll be talking about uh, acanthamoeba bicaritis uh, as a case study uh, as to how to manage uh, outbreaks uh, of uh, atypical infections of the cornea. Um, let me go ahead and start to uh, talk here. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is basically looking at atypical infections uh, and how you, uh, as a physician or um, area care professional, can look at these infections uh, and judge whether or not there is an outbreak going on and how to handle those and how to get to the root cause uh, to try to prevent uh, further injury uh, to other patients and hopefully uh, come to some conclusions about how to better manage uh, these uh, conditions. Um, so there is a lot of talk now about big data, and I think this talk, uh, ironically, is probably more about small data uh, than big data. Big data is often difficult to come by, it's expensive, uh, but there are some things we can learn from small data that uh, you can't learn from big data, uh, but also may give you clues as to how to approach uh, certain disease processes. Um, if we go back, uh, if you look at uh, England, for example, in the 1800s, you'll notice along the blue line below that the life expectancy in England changed very little from the 1500s all the way into the mid-1800s. And in fact, as a physician, by the time you finished training, you probably only had a few years of practice before you either retired or died. The interesting thing is this sort of jagged uh, uh, appearance to the life expectancy where it could vary from the mid 30s down into the mid 20s uh, from one year to the next. And if you look historically, the reason for this was that in Europe, uh, specific, generally, but uh, in London specifically, there were these outbreaks of uh, pandemics which would kill hundreds of thousands of people uh, at a time, often uh, younger people, and this would really have a significant impact on their life expectancy. Now, many didn't understand how these were occurring, and one of the popular theories at the time was something called the miasmatic theory. And that theory was that disease was transmitted through exposure to bad air, usually from foul or rotting organic matter. This was a, a, a theory that had been actually um, held throughout history, uh, and that the, 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 specifically that disease was transmitted through breathing and not direct contact or ingestion. And this was applied to things like the bubonic plague, cholera, et cetera. If you look at in London specifically, as I mentioned earlier, you can see that there are these cholera outbreaks uh, that occurred. And these had a very significant impact on life expectancy in London specifically. Um, and because of this, uh, they decided to do something about it since it was continued to happen in cycles over uh, every few years or so. The city um, began a large project basically directing human waste away from homes directly into the River Thames, which is the main source also of water for London. Um, and this flows from north to south. And you can see a diagram here below of an example of how um, human waste was put into a sewer and that sewer then led directly uh, to, um, to the River Thames. Uh, also, transport of water to homes was expensive, so most of London, as in many places, was relied on central uh, taps, meaning, or water fountains, where people would gather with their water for the day and then bring it back to their homes. The interesting thing about this was that there was an obstetrician and anesthesiologist named John Snow, and he was a skeptic of this theory of disease transmission and actually went in and looked at uh, how the patterns of cholera had occurred in, uh, in London. Uh, and looking at some of the recent outbreaks of cholera there. He interestingly identified that there was a particular water company that supplied the south of London, at the south end of the River Thames in London, that was responsible for almost 50% of all the deaths in London from cholera. And from this, he felt that there was some other mode of transmission other than breathing and bad air. An opportunity came uh, with the Soho outbreak in August of 1854. The opportunity was that there was a severe outbreak uh, that was pervasive in a community. Uh, they were, there were 127 dead within three days of the initial case, 500 dead within the first 10 days, and about 13% of all the people who uh, contracted the disease actually died. And you can see here in the diagram on the right, uh, from the outbreak, they basically were looking at all types of temperature, humidity, uh, wind gusts and everything else is a, uh, in order to look for a pattern that might have explained why this cholera outbreak occurred at that time. 
John Snow met uh, Reverend, Hen Reverend Henry Whitehead, who was a pastor in a local church uh, that was a part of a commission that was brought together to investigate this particular cholera outbreak. He spoke with John Snow and he gave him uh, an idea of his theories and his writings. And he was actually a skeptic uh, of John Snow's supposition that the miasmatic theory was incorrect. So Reverend Henry Whitehead, who had the skill of basically knowing the community well and the trust of the community, went out and interviewed the local residents. And after he interviewed them, uh, he was much um, more in line with John Snow's theory uh, that, the, that that bad air was not the cause. In fact, in the upper left-hand side of your slide, you'll see the, the, that central tap, which was called at that time the Broad Street Tap, uh, where there was a water pump. And Reverend Henry White had mapped out all of the cases of cholera and realized, looking at this, that almost all the cases were centered around this particular tap. And this is a mock-up on the right you see here, which is not from the original investigation, but showing that almost all of these cases radiated from the Broad Street tap and did not have any relationship to any of the other taps that are around it. <clears throat> and this is <clears throat> a photograph here of the Broad Street tap. It still exists there as a monument uh, to, to this particular uh, outbreak. As you'll remember, they were using the sewer system uh, now in order to uh, funnel waste away from homes. Uh, what happened in this particular situation was that there was actually a break uh, in, the, in the pipes that led to the sewer, which led to um, direct contamination from the human waste from this one particular home directly into the Broad Street tap. So a, a baby actually contracted cholera in this home and all the, all the waste was going directly into the Broad Street tap. And this was discovered as a cause uh, for the cholera outbreak, particularly severe and pervasive in just this one community. What this taught us was that public health disease, uh, we have a limited understanding of transmission mechanism of disease and treatment. And if we have a disease that has episodic outbreaks, there were, are usually a large number of cases which respected geography and really allowed study in this particular case. The, the good thing was that there was an established infrastructure and that there were healthcare professionals who had thought about this and written about it and had theories that they could test out based on this particular outbreak. And with local community help, um, Henry Whitehead specifically understanding the community and being able to track the cases accurately. What happened in this case is that they began to get a clinical understanding of disease and because of that clinical understanding, they were able to ask appropriate questions about the outbreak and come to a conclusion at a fairly sh uh, rapid pace. And really this is a testament to the collaboration between these two investigators. What this was, was really the birth of epidemiology. And really this is more than just statistics. This brings together expertise from multiple disciplines, including physicians, epidemiologists, and biostatisticians. And it really proved the power of what a small, well-designed study based on an outbreak of a particular infection can lead to uh, in terms of uh, altering the course of history. And if you think about this, this actually led to the eventual demise of the miasmatic theory so that people understood that this was more contact and ingestion uh, that was causing uh, these outbreaks of cholera. And as you may recall from the original slide, the uh, life expectancy of all of Europe uh, really exponentially increased uh, after this particular um, mode of transmission was finally discovered and proven uh, in no small part secondary to this. This has really led to our most recent uh, definition of an outbreak. And basically, this is the occurrence of more cases of a disease than expected in a given area or among a specific group of people over a particular period of time. So the important thing is that you need to, number one, establish what the disease is. So you need to establish what a case definition is, specifically what type of infection, how do you prove it, how do you confirm it. You want to confirm that those cases are real cases and then you want to establish a background incidence of disease so that you can understand whether there's actually an increase and how much of an increase there actually is. It turns out that atypical corneal infections are actually ideal for this in a number of ways, and I'll explain why in just a moment. When we approach corneal infections, we know that these may be bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic. The characteristics are really fairly common to these atypical corneal infections, and they're, they're generally rare or uncommon diseases. They're often difficult to diagnose, they're unresponsive to commonly available medications. If they were responsive, they would just disappear and you wouldn't see them uh, uh, at specific centers. 
And these infections, unfortunately, are often unique to the eye because of the unusual character of the cornea uh, and, its, uh, and, and its immune privilege. They really offer the, the greatest challenge to treatment, but they also offer the greatest opportunity for understanding mechanisms of disease. So let's take a look at Acanthamoeba specifically. Uh, it's a free living protozoa that's found in most sources of water and soil. We know that there's a seasonal variation based on uh, temperature and humidity. Uh, and this was really only first identified as an eye pathogen back in 1973. So this is a traditionally rare disease, the incidence we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, it's easily traceable because it requires specific and special diagnostic modalities as well as specialized compounded medications. So generally these patients aren't going to randomly get better on their own. Uh, and so they need to go to a specialty area or a specialty physician in order to treat them. It's also primarily a disease of the eye. It's really rarely described as an encephalitis, cutaneous, or visceral disease. So there's really little help from the systemic medical literature uh, because of its rarity um, in terms of epidemiology and also treatment. Acanthamoeba outbreaks are actually quite similar to what you saw with cholera, and they, they out, they're generally outbreaks that occur in different periods in different places around the world. Uh, the most studied areas are probably in the UK um, with John Dart. Uh, there have also been a number of outbreaks here in the US, uh, specifically uh, across the US in the 1980s, and then most recently in Iowa in 1992, and the current one that we'll be talking about today. So we're gonna start off with a couple of questions. Who is at greatest risk for contracting acanthamoeba keratitis? Soft contact lens wearers who wear their lenses only during the day, soft contact lens wearers who wear their lenses overnight, gas permeable contact lens wearers who wear their lenses only during the day, or gas permeable contact lens wearers who wear their lenses overnight. And feel free to answer. Interesting. Uh, so we'll talk about this in just a moment, but in fact, the greatest risk uh, for contracting acanthamoeba keratitis is actually gas permeable contact lens wearers who wear their lenses overnight. And I'll explain why in just a moment. Here's a second question. How often is contact lens related acanthamoeba keratitis bilateral? That's never 1%, 10%, or 25% of cases. 10% of cases, that's actually correct. Uh, there, although there is quite a spread here. Um, so let's go on. If you, if you look at what we've learned over history is that who gets acanthamoeba keratitis is a very important question because when you have patients who come in with unusual infections that are not easily diagnosed, if you go back to their history, it will often point you to the possibility or, of acanthamoeba keratitis as being uh, their presenting disease process. It turns out that if you look at general contact lens wearers that um, almost 85 to 100 percent of cases, depending on the study, are in contact lens wearers. The rates, however, are actually very similar between the two in general, meaning that soft contact lens wearers and rigid contact lens wearers or gas permeable hard contact lens wearers actually have a very similar incidence of acanthamoeba keratitis. But if you look at it, orthokeratology specifically in patients who wear gas permeable hard contact lenses overnight have a significantly higher rate of acanthamoeba keratitis than any of the other groups, uh, as, as I mentioned in the question before. And this may have to do with uh, tap water exposure of the contact lenses just prior to insertion at night uh, as part of most of the care regimens. And interestingly, if you look at most of the large series, bilateral disease occurs anywhere between 7 to 11% of patients with acanthamoeba keratitis, probably by far the highest rate of any of the pathogens that can infect the cornea. Uh, and this is probably because those contact lenses are kept in the same environment that's responsible for acanthamoeba colonizing uh, their contact lenses in the first place. The good news is, is that if you're a non-contact lens where the rate of infection is actually quite low, somewhere around one per million adults per year. So moving on, uh, in, historically we know that there's a geographic variation to acanthamoeba. Uh, in the Iowa outbreak, for example, they were able to identify uh, those areas that had the highest rates of acanthamoeba keratitis as being those counties that were flooded uh, in a recent upper Mississippi flood, um, and also the use, interestingly, of municipal water versus well water. And so municipal water actually seemed to be a source or a risk factor of these four infections. And this is not surprising. Uh, much of the excellent work that was done by John Dart and Simon Kilvington in the, U in the UK showed that there was a significant geographic variation in England in their outbreaks there. And in fact, water quality had a significant impact on that uh, 
in, the, in those areas where there was hard water that there was a much higher rate of infection, probably because of biofilm formation in the water supply. And really the nail in the coffin was looking at uh, several of their cases, 27 of which, where they went into the patient's homes and were uh, able to multi do multiple samples of the domestic water tap, including showers, kitchen water, et cetera. And they found that in 30% of those that they were able to identify acanth amoeba in their home domestic water supply, and that six of those isolates were actually uh, identical genetically to the keratitis specimens who were isolated from the patient's eye. And what was pointed to was that these patients uh, all had these water storage tanks or rooftop cisterns that kept water in times of water shortage, uh, and that acanth amoeba had a tendency to grow in those uh, in the biofilm that accumulated at the bottom of those particular cisterns uh, as, a, as a source for their infection. So looking at our most re recent outbreak, uh, at, here at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where I am, we, our cornea service has had some expertise in confocal microscopy since the early, or late 1990s. We had the second installed unit of the CompScan 2 here in the US, and we had actually uh, gained a fair working experience with it to the point where we became a regional center for referrals for confocal microscopy, most of which were specifically for acanthamoeba keratitis. In those first few years, we identified anywhere between zero to three cases. So uh, this was entirely consistent with the previous incidence of uh, acanthamoeba keratitis in the US, which was estimated to be somewhere around two cases per million contact lens wearers per year. Uh, interestingly, that was actually an outbreak incident, so the baseline incidence was actually probably far lower than that, which was actually reflective of many times zero cases that we would see. We began seeing, however, in 2003, an increasing number of cases uh, that were um, uh, really uh, owed to the referral patterns that we already had in place. And we published this paper uh, in 2004 showing that uh, the incidence prior to 2000 three and after was significantly higher, almost six times higher, um, between six and 40 cases in the period before and after uh, 2003. And this was also noted by uh, investigators at the Wills Eye Institute, which presented their findings at the American Academy of Ophthalmology in Chicago, ironically, in 2005, where they had identified 19 cases over the preceding couple of years. Uh, we eventually did uh, also publish our cases in 2006. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had had 40 cases. You can see a patient here with an epithelial form of acanthamoeba keratitis in the photograph. The CDC became interested and did a survey of 10 centers around the country, and they were able to reproduce the increase that we had seen after 2003, uh, almost an exponential increase, as you can see here, uh, both culture and non-culture uh, confirmed cases. So harking back to the cholera outbreaks where you see that they, they were mapping all types of different uh, uh, conditions that were associated, uh, previously associated with uh, an outbreak of cholera. Uh, these were some of the factors that were looked at originally, including the introduction of no-rub solutions in the early 2000s, the introduction of and really dominance of the market with silicone hydrogels uh, in and around 2003. Uh, but we also looked at AMO Complete Moisture Plus, which is a new solution uh, that was introduced in 2004. And in fact, when we look at this, uh, and the CDC also looked at this at the same time, uh, we found that the odds ratio was about 16 times greater if you were to have been exposed to AMO Complete Moisture Plus for contracting acanthamoeba keratitis versus other solutions. There are also some hygiene-related factors, including solution reuse, infrequent rubbing of lenses, and showering with lenses that contributed. And this really went to the recall of that particular solution from the market. But in our paper, we identified that even though it was independently associated with a risk of contracting acanthamoeba among soft contact lens wearers, it did not explain all of the cases. And we felt that there were other additional factors that were probably uh, involved. Uh, when the CDC published their paper a few years later, you can see that they were remarkably similar in terms of the uh, um, the risk factors that they identified, which gave us uh, reassurance that we were on the right track in terms of at least our data set. As I mentioned earlier, though, uh, we only found, and this was also confirmed, I think, in other studies, that only about 50% of the patients were using AMO Complete Moisture Plus. If you took all of those patients out, you would still have, in Chicago at least, a five times greater number of cases that were, than was estimated in the 1980s outbreak. 
So we felt clearly that there was something other than just AMO Complete Moisture Plus as a factor in determining uh, this risk and outbreak of acanthamoeba keratitis. So locally, we were able to understand this and really look into this more deeply. And this is really a testament to Charlotte Joslin, who was a PhD candidate in epidemiology at the time and my main collaborator in all of these studies. And you can see here in that original paper in 2006, Dr. Joslin had actually identified that all of the cases of acanthamoeba were actually peripheral in the peripheral counties where the population was less uh, than in the central area of Chicago. In fact, there were fewer cases where the population was higher not just per capita, but total uh, in the Chicagoland area. And she started to look into reasons for this. And again, harking back to the um, Broad Street TAP uh, investigation, you can see here, uh, again, the geographic variation was very important. And if you looked at the water distribution system in, in Chicago, there was actually a central TAP, meaning that uh, water had, um, is tapped out of Lake Michigan. It's processed through two plants here uh, on the coast of Lake Michigan and then distributed through the rest of the Chicagoland area. And so what we're seeing is that at the end of these water runs is where that those infections were occurring, uh, not so centrally. Uh, looking into why this is, we had all of these other factors that we uh, had looked at and identified as possible uh, causes for the acanthamoeba outbreak. But interestingly, also in 2003, uh, our Environmental Protection Agency changed rules on the amount of disinfectant byproducts there could be uh, in the end supply uh, of, of these water runs. And for this reason, uh, different communities had taken different tacks, either changing their disinfectants completely or reducing the levels to try to bring them to quote unquote safe levels uh, to try to prevent um, uh, cancer, and et cetera. That was actually not very well proven as causes for this. So you can see here, uh, Dr. Joslin looked at the water treatment system and she was able to identify and uh, show that uh, water that was entering the peripheral areas of uh, Chicago actually had a significantly lower uh, amount of chlorine than prior to 2003. And even though we don't have specific confirmation of this, it appears that uh, the reason for um, increase in acanthamoeba keratitis was probably a decrease in the amount of disinfectant uh, in the water supply. Now the disinfectant specifically does not kill acanthamoeba, but it does kill bacteria. And bacterial biofilm is actually a, a place where acanthamoeba lives and also the, the bacteria is what is considered a food source for acanthamoeba. So any increase in biofilm, any increase in uh, bacterial contamination of the water uh, and pipes uh, would lead to an increase in acanthamoeba in the water system. And you can see here that over time, as that disinfectant uh, continued to decrease in, in its efficacy, that the number of cases that were occurring in Chicago increased uh, as you got closer and closer to the center as time went on, which is not surprising as the water, uh, uh, as the pipes basically started to deteriorate. And where we were, um, uh, that where this was confirmed was that even after the recall of Complete Moisture Plus, uh, the, there, was a, there was not a significant reduction in the number of cases of acanthamoeba, either in the Chicagoland area or nationwide, uh, just from that recall. Uh, there was a small decrease, but generally it did not return to baseline, as you can see here from the CDC study, looking at the same 10 centers they had uh, um, interviewed before. And the University of Illinois, over the past several years, we've continued to have an instance around 10 to 12, sometimes higher cases here. Uh, in a study uh, that we did of the water supply, uh, we were also able to show, and again, this is a non-random sampling, that the water supply in the Chicagoland area had the highest recorded rate of acanthamoeba found in the water taps here, um, short of the uh, specific uh, case of the UK where they were only looking at patients who had acanthamoeba. So in summary for this portion, acanthamoeba keratitis is a rare condition. Uh, from this small study, we were able to uh, identify environmental risk factors that are probably not modifiable at this time. Um, and we have started to recommend uh, strongly that uh, the tap water not be involved in the system of contact lens rinsing or, or, or hygiene, either for hard or gas permeable contact lenses. So in addition to this, um, this is also another opportunity that's been taken in the past when there are large outbreaks, really to look at uh, 
refining the management uh, of these particular atypical infections uh, as using the patients uh, that we have uh, to try to improve their therapy and improve their outcomes. So now we're going from big data to small data. And then from small data, we're actually going to really small data. So now we are not looking at the large data set, but now we're looking at small portions of those patients uh, as, um, as a guide to how to improve therapy, uh, which is even more difficult. So atypical infections, a general approach, uh, as I mentioned, they have these characteristics of being difficult to diagnose, being poorly responsive. Uh, generally, when we have an atypical infection that hasn't responded to a medication, we look at them, we do uh, bio or microbiologic testing, we do imaging, uh, really with the goal to identify the causative pathogen. Uh, we always start empiric therapy because uh, antibacterials are usually the first line of therapy because they will be the most catastrophic if untreated, uh, but then this is always uh, considered a best guess therapy. But if it fails that, then we have to try to see what the next step would be. One is if you've identified the pathogen, then you can determine a specific therapy and based on historical uh, studies of efficacy, um, we can treat based on that. If, however, the pathogen is unidentified, then we have to keep guessing and that includes other empiric therapy, there may be further diagnostics, diagnostics, and if it remains unidentified at that point, um, usually people will default to it being a herpetic infection or acanthamoeba um, or some sort of non-infectious process. And ultimately, if the eye continues to deteriorate, they may require surgery. So what have we done in terms of uh, advances in clinical management? Well, there are diagnostic techniques for acanthamoeba keratitis acanthamoeba keratitis, which vary widely and wildly between centers. In fact, in the UK at the time, they re really did not employ confocal microscopy. It was heavily relied on here in the US. Um, and so it was when we, when we published the study, there was always some question as to whether our cases really were consistent with cases of other large outbreaks, really to determine whether our diagnostic capabilities were correct and also whether our treatment outcomes were really uh, congruous with other centers and other previous studies. So the standard microbiologic techniques that we use for acanthamoeba include culture, histologic smears, pathology, PCR detection in some centers, and really, as I mentioned in the US, uh, they have relied a lot on confocal microscopy. And here is just an example of a geme sustain on the left showing the crenated uh, edges of an acanthamoeba cyst. You can see the same patient with the acanthamoeba target cyst that you see on the right. So we looked at our first 53 patients and we did all the tests that were available to us at the time, excluding PCR. Uh, and we were able to show that the sensitivity and specificity, including the negative and positive predictive values are actually quite good, whether you use culture positivity only uh, as, a, as a standard, or if you used a composite diagnosis, including clinical microbiology uh, and, and, uh, and, and smears. So we felt that in our hands, at least, the confocal microscopy was helpful uh, and was easily uh, reproducible and sensitive. So from this, we were able to draw conclusions from patients that we had seen uh, that would, I think, be helpful in, in further diagnosis. Here's a uh, first question in the section. What is the most important presenting prognostic factor for a patient's visual outcome who has acanthamoeba keratitis? So there had actually been a quite, quite a bit written uh, about this prior to our study. And I think it's been adopted now that our study is probably correct uh, in determining how outcomes are determined on a patient's first presentation. Uh, generally, most people would consider the duration of symptoms uh, was the, the hallmark of when a patient would do well or not do well. One month is usually pointed to as the break point. But in our study of prognostic factors, we were able to demonstrate, and this is just of the first 72 eyes that we saw, that duration of symptoms, even though it did often lead to deeper disease, was not independently uh, tied to visual outcomes. And in fact, uh, really the patients with a good prognosis had superficial disease, meaning that they had either just primarily an epitheliitis and radial neuritis was not a prognostic factor uh, in our study, uh, or anterior stromal disease. If, however, they had deep stromal keratitis, a ring infiltrate, or any signs of extracorneal inflammation, this led to a 10 times more likely uh, risk factor for uh, ending up with worse visual outcome, meaning 20, 30 or worse. So the, this was really um, the basic uh, tenet of that particular study. Uh, 
Second, next question, does having acanthamoeba keratitis confer immunity against future infections? So many patients, their first question is, when can I get back into my contact lenses again? And the answer is complicated. And if the, I think basically uh, the answer that all of you have taken is no. And this actually came to light uh, in this particular patient. We have a 16-year-old male who had uh, basically two acanthamoeba keratitis episodes one year apart in the same eye. I had worried that we had not fully treated the acanthamoeba in their first eye, and that it was actually a recurrence more than it was um, than a reinfection. But we had had, uh, at the time, been uh, genotyping all of these. And so we were able to show in that particular publication that this patient actually contracted two separate distinct isolates of acanthamoeba one year apart, and he had actually moved 900 miles away, and so it wasn't entirely his environment. And there is some statistical, or there is some suggestion in many studies that patients who are uh, at risk uh, for acanthamoeba once may actually be at higher risk for acanthamoeba a second time, so it's something that you should be aware of. Next question, which of the following have been identified as co-pathogens with acanthamoeba keratitis? So it turns out that acanthamoeba keratitis is actually a very interesting organism in that if you look uh, in all of the literature, it has basically been associated with infections from every single genus, and that includes bacteria, herpes simplex, <clears throat> mold, and even other amoeba, including Hartmanella and Valcamphia. Uh, this came to light uh, from the, this patient, uh, who was a patient of a colleague of mine, Sandeep Jain, here at the UICI Center an eye and ear infirmary, where a patient who was diagnosed with acanthamoeba keratitis was improving dramatically over a period of two or three weeks. Uh, from this slide to the slide on the bottom left it was one day the patient went from seeing better and feeling better to feeling much worse. And you can see the patient developed these deep infiltrates, which turned out to be a strep viridans. Um, and in looking back through the literature, uh, we found that crystalline keratopathy or infectious crystalline keratopathy was actually related to acanthamoeba keratitis quite, uh, quite strongly as far as 20 or 30 years ago, uh, first reported by Elizabeth Cohen uh, at that time at the Wills Eye Institute. And this uh, spurred us to look into our cases of acanthamoeba keratitis to see how many of them actually were polymicrobial. And we only were able to demonstrate about 4.5% that had co-isolates. And we feel that this is probably because there's an availability of broad spectrum antibiotics that sterilize these corneas prior to them coming to us as a tertiary care center for a diagnosis. But if you look through history, you can see that there are significant uh, levels of co-pathogens noted, including fungus and bacteria in all of the large studies, which, which suggests that acanthamoeba does, um, it does coexist with other contaminants and pathogens, uh, both as a food source, but uh, for other reasons. And you can see here, uh, one of the characteristics of acanthamoeba that makes it uh, ideal for this is that it can harbor endosymbionts. So it does eat bacteria, but often the bacteria are not digested uh, by the acanthamoeba. And these can all exist inside of the acanthamoeba un, uh, untouched by its own immune system. And so we were able to look at um, this was actually from uh, Alfonso Ayavena, who is at the University of British Columbia currently, but was at Miami with Darlene Miller, who looked at uh, 38 of their acanthamoeba keratitis isolates. And you can see that 60% of them actually were harboring endosymbionts, and this was really reflective of their environmental play, uh, prey. Uh, with um, uh, Eric Perlman, who was at the time at, in Cleveland, we did a study in uh, mice, which showed that in those patients who had acanthamoeba that had an endosymbiont, that those cause a great deal more inflammation and scarring uh, when treated uh, versus those that did not. So these confer pathogenicity uh, and also alter the outcome of these patients as a possible uh, reason for why pa some patients do better and some patients do worse. And this is not un uh, unheard of. Uh, with Oncocerca specifically, for some time, we've known that this can be a significant corneal infection uh, that comes from the systemic uh, circulation. Um, but interestingly, most of the scarring or the most significant scarring often occurs after killing the Oncocerca. And it turns out that in these patients that are in these particular pathogens, that they have um, an endosymbiont called Wolbachia. And treating the Wolbachia will often reduce the amount of inflammation that occurs because it's not liberated after uh, killing the Oncocerca. So this brought to mind the question of whether or not patients should be on concurrent antimicrobial therapy. We know that bacterial copathogens are really the most common copathogen, uh, 
Uh, other classes of organisms are certainly rare. Uh, interestingly, in the first uh, paper, we did not uh, include this because we weren't sure to what to make of it, but uh, we noticed that in the prior therapy that those patients who used a non-benzoconium chloride containing antibiotic prior to presentation had a poorer outcome in univariate analysis, which did not, um, did not stay in the, in, the, uh, in the significant category once the multivariate analysis was done. So we looked at this as benzoconium chloride, um, and we know that this is a hotly debated uh, um, additive in ophthalmic drugs. It's basically found in everything, including, including most anti-infectives. The interesting thing is that if you look at benzoconium chloride by itself, it actually has uh, almost an equal efficacy to hydrogen peroxide for certain species of acanthamoeba, while the fluoroquinolones have none. And so our supposition is that if you do treat early a patient with acanthamoeba keratitis with a benzoconium chloride containing antibiotic, that you're probably getting some therapeutic effect from the benzoconium chloride and not from the moxifloxacin. And you can see here a more complex graph showing that. Uh, but this is for many different species of uh, acanth amoeba, which it holds true for almost all of them, that it is effective. And it's interesting to think that moxifloxacin was also introduced around the same time. And then finally, if you look at uh, medical therapy and how we've been able to improve um, uh, the treatment of acanth amoeba keratitis based, again, on this small group of patients, um, the standard medical therapy we, we usually employ prior was mechanical debridement. Uh, this does help debulk the or organism load. It also helps confirm the diagnosis because acanth amoeba is an infection that takes a long time to treat and may have many ups and downs. And being unsure of the underlying diagnosis can certainly lead you astray in, in trying to treat something else or treating it differently. Um, we normally start with a combination of medications. Some of the milder cases, we'll start with a biguanide, either uh, chlorhexidine or PHMB. Um, if you have available to you a hexamidine or propamidine, uh, we use these every hour. Now, the hexamidine and propamidine are diamidines, which, are, which have a significant surface toxicity. And you can see over on the right, the patient was actually getting a conjunctival burn here inferiorly. And usually after two or three weeks of therapy, the patients will actually have significant discomfort just from the diamidine itself. And I usually will taper this off and discontinue this by a month. But the backbone of therapy right now is really the biguanide, either chlorhexine 0.02% or PHMB 0.02%. We will add systemic meds as indicated, which I'll explain in just a moment. And steroids are either eliminated or reduced at diagnosis. We know that prior use of steroids, um, uh, prior to effective anti-acanthamoeal therapy, uh, will worsen their prognosis, but it's unclear what to do with them uh, if they're already on them. Uh, we know that if we discontinue them uh, acutely, that the patients may have significant rebound inflammation, uh, and uh, which may result in more morbidity uh, than reducing and eliminating the steroids uh, at the time of diagnosis. So as I was intimating earlier, we are using 2030 as a, a vis as a visual result. And if you look at uh, past studies, you can see actually the visual results in patients who are successfully treated for acanthamoeba are actually pretty good. You can see 2040 or better in most of the studies uh, constituted uh, somewhere over 60 to 80 percent of patients. In ours, it was significantly higher. Uh, but if you look at all of these studies, however, there are some patients who do, don't do well, meaning that they end up with less than 2100 vision or uh, they end up with a corneal transplant or even loss of the eye. So we know that there can be clinical resistance to acanthamoeba keratitis uh, treatment and that up to 5% may remain persistently culture positive even with intensive and appropriate therapy for these patients. And this was published in 2002 and still remains true today. Voriconazole uh, was an agent that we looked at specifically um, from a, a paper that uh, Gordon Bisvazara from the CDC. Uh, let me see if I can get rid of this, sorry. There we go. Um, we know from other ophthalmic uses that it has high bioavailability. There's an oral and an IV form. Uh, it's good that it has equal tissue levels regardless if it's given intravenously or orally. Uh, it's been extensively studied for use in, in endophthalmitis locally when it's administered intravitreally. Um, based on the paper I was mentioning, which I'll describe in just a moment, uh, it's actually the first paper and reference listed on the right here. Uh, it does have clinical activity against acanthamoeba and was used in a cocktail uh, of other drugs to um, 
to combat uh, acanthamoeba encephalitis successfully in a few patients. Um, the, there are significant mixed results, however, in, in vitro sensitivity testing, which really uh, is inaccurate uh, at this time and, and unstandardized. Uh, so in, in vitro sensitivity testing uh, is often not helpful in identifying whether a compound is effective or not, but may be helpful in identifying candidate compounds if you choose to use them uh, in the treatment of acanthamoeba uh, in the future. So as far as voriconazole and acanthamoeba keratitis, this was previously described both as a topical, as a topical adjunct of therapy uh, from, the, uh, from the Wilmer Eye Institute uh, as having some benefit. Um, we published a paper using oral uh, voriconazole and we found that in three eyes of two patients who had chronic culture proven stromal keratitis that there was resolution with its sole use after several months of therapy. In fact, both of these patients that we treated we treated for a month, they got significantly better. We discontinued treatment and they all recurred about six to eight weeks later. Uh, we put them back on therapy uh, for anywhere between uh, three to seven months and the patients finally resolved uh, their uh, acanthamoeba infections. And you can find that publication below. The other agent that was looked at in that particular paper uh, by Dr. Um, Visvasara was miltepicin. This is an anti leishmaniasis drug that has anti-acanthamoebal activity. It's relatively low toxicity and it's used widely in developing countries against leishmaniasis, particularly, particularly in, in areas of tropical climate. It, helped, it was found to actually have a more significant inhibitory effect on acanthamoeba with cytal activity of about 40 micrograms per cc, um, much more effective than voriconazole. This is the first patient that we treated with miltepicin a patient who had had multiple transplants and had multiple recurrences of the acanthamoeba, each one proven uh, by pathology. Uh, and you can see that after treatment, the patient had significant inflammation, um, but eventually resolved. And with a new transplant, the patient's kept this transplant clear now, free of disease now for about seven or eight years. And so we feel that this is uh, another alternative for therapy. Other alternative therapies include uh, casperfungin, pentamidine, which have been used in the past, which I think there's much less experience with at this point. Um, uh, I should say a brief word about crosslinking and corneal surgery. Uh, corneal collagen crosslinking uh, has been uh, used in many centers as an adjunctive therapy. It is not a primary therapy for many infections uh, and specifically for acanthamoeba. Um, we know that it does the riboflavin and um, wavelengths and energy that are delivered for a standard crosslinking really don't have significant effect as against acanthamoeba cysts. Um, and it may have more of a collagen stabilizing effect. It may reduce pain by killing the surface nerves and may reduce inflammation by killing the white blood cells that are in the area uh, while the acanthamoeba is being killed by, uh, by chemical and medical therapy. Uh, surgery, uh, generally we reserve that specifically for patients who have failed all other therapy. Uh, the prognosis is not great. Recurrence rates can be high, but they're significantly better than they were 20 or 30 years ago, simply because we have better medications now than we did then uh, to really take care of any residual infection that may be there. So in summary, we're going from big data to small data to really small data. But the important thing is that it be good, clean data. And this is probably more important than having a large data set that's sort of messy and, and uh, unverified. You want to have a team approach to planning, gathering, and analyzing data. And you want to take the time to think about that data and how to generate new hypotheses based on your own knowledge of not only the local, but also the disease processes, something that epidemiologists and biostatisticians uh, do not have. And working as a team, you'll really come up with the most likely uh, explanations for things uh, to minimize the amount of extra work that you have to do in order to come to a hypothesis and conclusion. We know also that medical treatment of recalcitrant atypical keratinities uh, it relies on accurate identification and isolation. You want, val you want balanced susceptibility testing, which does not uh, exist currently for acanthamoeba, or acanthamoeba pathogens. Um, and we have the added benefit of being able to use uh, compounded anti-infectives uh, where the safety and efficacy can be better proven. Acanthamoeba keratitis, as I mentioned earlier, is a rare infection. We know that contact lens wear in developed countries is a primary risk factor, but water exposure in third world countries or underdeveloped countries uh, is the primary risk factor there. Uh, deviations in local water quality are, will amplify the number of infections and the amount of risk. 
uh, that patients uh, are exposed to, uh, and the current risk factors in the U.S. are probably not modifiable since we continue to see acanth mimic keratitis, base, keratitis at basically the same levels we had previously. And then finally, uh, in cases, uh, the increase in cases of acanth mimic keratitis have led to innovation in treatments uh, uh, beyond just discovering what the base risk factors are and that we were able to identify alternative topical and systemic medications uh, judge better the, the role of surgical intervention and uh, also the role of immunosuppression in preventing uh, immune-related uh, complications of uh, acanthamine keratitis while you're treating it. There are also advanced diagnostic methods uh, and future contact lens disinfection systems that will be in play. Uh, I would refer you to the particular pub publication that's on this page as looking at, the, um, looking at outbreak um, outbreaks of acanthamoeba and microsporidia as models uh, for what you can do uh, locally. Um, and so please uh, feel free to take a look at that. And so it's a complex um, tree here in terms of investigating something, but it's important that you have some infrastructure, that you have clinical expertise and have good collaborators. Uh, and from that, you can really do a lot of good with a, with, uh, with a small outbreak uh, in terms of, um, for example, we've seen about 250 to 300 patients, but most of these conclusions we came to within the first 100 or so. So if you have something like that, there's a lot you can do with it uh, with, uh, with relatively small resources. Uh, so manpower and thought is probably your best, uh, best ally here. And I do want to acknowledge that this, was, uh, this did involve a lot of different people. Um, without question, Charlotte Joslin uh, was a main driver of this. Uh, uh, investigation, uh, my uh, partner and mentor, Joel Sugar, uh, and here at the University of Illinois, uh, and then members of uh, the Ohio State University uh, and Case Western University as well, um, all were involved in many of these investigative studies. Um, and I thank you for your attention. Be happy to take questions. I'll take a look here. Um, okay, so first question is, do the new contact lens materials or designs reduce the incidence of acanthamoeba keratitis? So the answer is no. Uh, the silicone hydrogels were the ones who were introduced in 2003, 2004, and the vast majority of acanthamoeba infections we see today are with those particular uh, materials. Now, uh, daily wear lenses, uh, daily disposable lenses, I'm sorry, uh, do probably have a lower uh, risk of acanthamoeba keratitis, but that's not from the material. It's most likely because they're not stored in solution and they're not handled as much. Now, you would think that it would almost be zero, but it's not. Uh, if you look at the two studies that John Dart and Fiona Stapleton did, uh, there was some small incidence uh, or of acanthamoeba keratitis in uh, even daily disposable lens wearers. Um, question is corneal decompression rate. I'm not exactly sure what that is. Perhaps you could uh, um, retype that question because I think it's uh, half in. Um, so here's a question that we don't, we don't have biguanide chlorhexidine here. How could we treat this uh, acanthamoeba keratitis? The answer is it's difficult, but you do have chlorhexidine. Um, chlorhexidine is a, uh, is a common compound. The question is whether your government and your hospital will allow you to compound it in the safer concentrations, again, 0.02% uh, that, uh, that are required for treatment. And you can go up to 0.06%, but we always start with 0.02%. Chlorhexidine is a common compound, um, and the barrier is not its availability. Its barrier is whether or not your local uh, uh, government or, um, or facility or compounding facility will allow you to compound it for topical use. If you don't have that, um, really the only commonly available drug that's been used in the past is chlorhexidine or is uh, neomycin. And uh, to be honest with you, neomycin, uh, I don't even include in our treatment regimen as you saw earlier because I don't think it's very effective. If you have access to propamidine or hexamidine that has some effect against trobozoites but is not very effective against cysts, so I think, unfortunately, biguanides are, are really the, the drug of choice, and you'll need to do some work with your local facilities to have them uh, learn how to compound it. Another alternative is PHMB, or polyhexylmethylbiguanide, which is actually a pool cleaner uh, 
which again is commonly available in every country around the globe um, and is relatively inexpensive, but again, has to be compounded. Chlorhexanine is easier because it's, um, it's in the pharmacopoeia, so it's known as a, it it's, uh, has information used as a human drug because it's used in hand uh, disinfectants and et cetera. That, uh, so it can, it, it's more likely to be um, allowed to be compounded than PHNB, but um, either one should be available. The question is whether or not your local government will allow you to use it. Um, okay. Um, how do we know when to add fortified voriconazole? <clears throat> so if you have available either voriconazole or miltefacin, um, I, if you don't have anything available, I think voriconazole you can try. I haven't found the fortified topicals to be as effective as the biguanides um, and haven't used them very often. I've used them as an adjunct and haven't found them really to be the answer necessarily in even those patients. Um, so if you have nothing else, I think it's worthwhile to use that. Um, but my experience is really more with systemic boriconazole than it is topical. Um, but I think I would add it uh, if whatever treatment you have is not, um, after a couple of weeks or so, is not showing any effect. Um, neomycin, I answered. Uh, there have, some been, have been some case reports of neomycin, actually maybe one case report in the past of neomycin being effective, uh, but generally in comparison to the current agents we have, including biquanides and the diamidines, uh, I think neomycin is very low, uh, has very low efficacy in this particular case. Worthwhile using if you have nothing else uh, or as an additive if you can't get something um, and not terribly effective. Um, so anonymous attendee is asking about unresponsive uh, to conventional treatment, uh, and that is where I was talking more about the voriconazole, the miltefacin, uh, collagen crosslinking may be of some benefit in that particular case as well. Um, the prognosis, I think, for corneal transplantation in these cases is poor if they're not responding to medical therapy, um, but continued therapy and allowing the acanthamoeba to to um, cause other problems either in the adnexa or in the eye itself. Uh, corneal transplantation may be an option at some point um, uh, before the patient starts to develop glaucoma and other problems including uh, intimus and cataract. Um, but those would be the things that I talked about in the talk as far as other potential treatments, the caspofungin, pentamidine, voriconazole, and miltefacin as well as collagen crossing cake. Um, I, uh, you would have to look at the chlorhexidine mouthwash to see what's in it. They often have other agents in there, and I am not familiar with anyone using that. It needs to be in the proper concentration because, as you know, straight 3% chlorhexidine will rapidly cause uh, corneal death uh, within a few uh, seconds of its application. So at full strength, chlorhexidine cannot be used in the eye. So you have to be very sure about the concentration that, he, that you're using. It has to be 0.02%, 0.04%, or 0.06%. Anything approaching the concentration that's used specifically for uh, hand disinfection or wound disinfection will rapidly cause a cornea to decompensate irreversibly. Uh, and so we see that uh, every now and then, uh, at least reports of it, uh, from people who use it in the eye in beta dye allergic patients that is very, very toxic. So you need to be sure of the concentration and also make sure that the additives in there that are, that are enabled to be used as a mouthwash uh, are, are not toxic to the eye. So um, here's a question about how to diagnose acanthamoeba keratitis clinically at an early stage. And actually that comes to the, it, that is actually the most important uh, aspect of diagnosis is really to suspect the possibility of acanthamoeba keratitis. So in a patient who has herpetic keratitis, for example, or something that looks like herpetic keratitis that doesn't respond appropriately to antivirals or persists beyond the week or 10 days that they normally would persist as an epithelial disease, or if they have a stromal keratitis that's not resolving uh, properly either with the use of topical steroids or the use of antivirals, uh, or if they're a contact lens wearer. So basically my answer is that if, if something if the patient has high risk factors uh, for acanthamoeba keratitis, including a history of water exposure or uh, or have had um, or, or contact lens wearers with 
a persistent infection that will not resolve with standard treatment, those patients immediately, the th first thing that you should think about is a amoeba keratitis, whether it be an epitheliopathy or a stromal keratitis, uh, and try to think of it early uh, and try to do the appropriate diagnosis or appropriate referrals to get the, the question of whether it is acanthamoeba answered. So really, I think the best uh, uh, advice I would have is basically to have the possibility of acanthamoeba in your mind as a possible diagnosis in every single patient, um, but not go chasing it necessarily in every single patient, but make sure that that's not at the back of your mind where you think of it two or three months later. And then finally, how could we prevent uh, waterborne, oh, not finally, uh, acanthamoeba keratitis? So um, specifically, it, there's not a lot you can do in terms of environmental water. If it's, I mean, it can be found in pond water, it can be found in domestic water, meaning water in your home. So if you're a contact lens wearer, which increases the risk of uh, acanthamoeba keratitis, you want to basically make sure that patients minimize their exposure to water when they're handling their contact lenses. Their hands should be dry after washing them, uh, preferably if you can use daily disposables and get rid of those lenses daily so you don't have to uh, use them um, or reuse them or store them near water. And also not to shower in lenses. So really exposure or limiting exposure is your best bet. If, however, you have acanthamoeba in your home water supply, that, that's a problem. It may be in the municipal supply, it may be in your home, um, if it's because it exists in a biofilm, often getting biofilm out of pipes is very, very difficult. Replacing them, flushing them with formaldehyde uh, are industrial ways uh, of getting rid of it. But once it's colonized, it's very difficult. So your best bet is really to try to avoid exposure uh, to water. And, you, and now bottled water, distilled water, those are not sterile. They, those, do, they, those may also harbor acanthamoeba. So you really need to have boiled water or filtered water uh, that, that will filter out these parasites for use in those particular um, uh, scenarios. So what sensitivity does confocal microscopy have? So uh, yeah, there was a recent paper. Uh, I can tell you, uh, I, I think I was on that paper actually, but um, the it varies from center to center. And so for me, I use, I am the one, I am the technician, and I also read the, read the confocals. And then also I take a look at corneal scrapings right after I do the confocal to try to get an idea. And that's really my experience. And I think there's, it's unparalleled. So if you have the ability to actually do the scans yourself and actually look at the slides yourself uh, afterwards, that will give you the best experience in determining what specific structures you're seeing on the confocal is. If you saw my slide earlier, in our center, the sensitivity and specificity are quite high in the 90, the 80 to 90 percent range. In other centers, it's much lower, and I think it has to do, uh, many of these centers don't use, they, they use a technician who may not be imaging the correct area, uh, so there, there are many different things you can do to increase your, your sensitivity and specificity uh, of confocal microscopy. And then finally, could this disease link to the swimming pool? In my country, there's more likely water contamination than contact lens wear. So the answer to that is yes. Uh, chlorine, as I intimated earlier, uh, which is the disinfectant that's basically been reduced, we think, here in the Chicagoland area, which has led to the increase, uh, does not directly kill acanthamoeba. Acanthamoeba is usually screened from the water supplies by filtration. So uh, depending on the type of disinfection of your pool water, yes, acanthamoeba could potentially live there very easily. Um, and so, you know, if, if the water is not properly filtered, it's also going to get in there just from rain uh, um, washing into it and everything else. So yes, it could be linked to swimming pools. It can be linked to swimming in ponds. It can be linked to, to swimming in the ocean. Even the ocean has a specific types of acanthamoeba that exists there uh, that are found that are maybe slightly different from fresh water. So, um, that's absolutely correct. In different countries, the, the risk factors are different. So um, if you have a patient who has a significant history of water exposure, who swims regularly or something like that, who has an unusual appearing keratitis, which may have some of the features of acanthamoeba, whether it be an epithelial disease or something deeper, um, that may be a risk factor that you'll need to look at as well um, as uh, leading to a possibility of acanthamoeba keratitis.